Let's give our confession of faith. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. Let's greet one another. The Holy Spirit is inside of you. And one more time. Jesus is inside of you. You must truly believe that. That Jesus is inside of you as the Holy Spirit. Only then will you receive the guidance of the Holy Spirit and the filling of the Word. And with that, the title today is The Mustard Seed Vision. In 2024, we made a strong start by holding on to the covenant God gave us of Isaiah 54 verse 2, enlarge the place of your tent. It will absolutely be fulfilled and so we had a strong start. And there are three tents that we must enlarge. And the first is expanding the church's tent and that's done through the Start 10,000 movement. We must continuously explain the tent of the church. It's the work of the Holy Spirit towards Asia, towards um, Macedonia, towards Rome, just like that. It must be a walk of faith according to the book of Acts. It's the journey that is natural for people of the Holy Spirit, a journey for the church. And so we must expand the church's tent through the Start 10,000 movement. And then we must expand the tent of the region through the 4,000 partisan movement. And we must expand the tent for the 237 uh, missions field through the 237 healing movement. And so if you saw on the video, the people that were proclaiming Jesus is the Christ, the solution to all problems, they were proclaiming it in Korean, but they were all actually um, Pakistan people who were doing the missions movement in Pakistan. And they were um, proclaiming world evangelization within a field um, where, you know, they're still at uh, war with Iran. And so our Pastor Chung is going towards the Muslim nations as well. So we must continually, continuously expand the place of our tent. In order to do that, we need to form the team of three. We must be spiritually equipped and go towards the covenantal challenge. And the biggest characteristic of God's word is that it will absolutely be fulfilled. Otherwise, why would we sit here and listen to it? It is clearly stated in Numbers chapter 23, verse 19. God is not man that he should lie, or a son of man that he should change his... He, has he said and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not fulfill it? And who does he work through? Through the people who believe the word and act according to it. So would God, the all-knowing and omnipotent creator, have nothing better to do than lie to his um, creations, the mankind? Do you think God is a liar? God is not someone who changes from time to time depending on problems and events and situations. He is someone who will carry out his words according to the people who believe in it. Many people don't believe. Many people don't make the resolution, even elders. Of course, not our church, but other churches. And even recently, there was um, I saw 
someone asking people that were coming out of the church after giving worship and they were asking, do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe in Jesus? And they were saying no. And according to the atmosphere, people pretend to believe. But you must really believe. And Apostle Paul also emphasizes this fact through Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it completion at the day of Jesus Christ. The fact that God gave you the covenant means that he will begin this good work. He told us to enlarge the place of our tent. So we hold on to that covenant and we act according to it with faith and God will fulfill it. And through whom is God accomplishing this task? Those who hold on to the covenant. Those who hold on to the covenant and believe it and act according to it. There's only one thing that we must do. We must hold on to the word that God gave us, go into concentration and challenge with it. Concentration and challenge. We don't do it, but we must do it. Actually go into Pakistan. Actually go to the ends of the earth. And next week we're going into the place of um, Kamchaka. It's really the end of the earth. And there is a Yewon regional church there. And that's where we're going camp into. It's already a field that's been given to us, but in order to give them more strength, we're going into that place. And nine people are going. And the people, the remnants that are here, they're, uh, they're just graduated high school, they're 1920, and they're wanting to go there to save the field of Russia. And they want to go to the theological seminary as well. People who are 20 years old, they are the TCK that are saying they want to save their, the, um, their own people in Russia. God has prepared everything. All we have to do is concentrate and challenge. That is the life of CVDIP. Amen? Those who have the covenant, they put it into practice. So really, you must have these challenges in your life. And with that covenant and vision, you must have your dream that you put into practice. That's the joy of living a walk of faith. And that's what a person of the Holy Spirit must be like. And the scripture that we'll look at today is called the parable of the mustard seed. So compared to the other Gospels, the Gospel of Mark contains fewer parables and condenses them in a very simple way. And although the themes of the various parables Jesus told differ in their emphasis, they are all about the expansion of the kingdom of God. And the biggest characteristic of the mustard seed parable is also the expansion of God's kingdom. And this parable is consistent with the message of the covenant that God gave us. Enlarge the place of your tent. And in fact, our walk of faith should focus on the message that Jesus gave just before he uh, ascended. Because everything is within that. After he finished his public ministry, just before he ascended, um, he, while he remained for that short amount of time on this earth, he gave us the most important mission. And as people who have received salvation, we live our life, and alongside our studies and going to work and all of that, there should be the important mission that we do, and that's what Jesus gave to us. And according to that, your whole life can change. 
Jesus gave the last mission. That's the key point of our walk of faith. The core of what Jesus taught his disciples for 40 days after his resurrection was the kingdom of God. He didn't just become resurrected and ascend straight away. And the resurrection is eternal life. So he, he, he proclaimed that he was resurrected and that we also can receive this eternal life. So because our faith is weak, he decided to stay longer after his resurrection for 40 days to proclaim the kingdom of God and that the kingdom of God exists and that that's where he will ascend to. He really gave assurance for the 40 days so that the disciples could do the work of evangelism. And through the Mount of Olives covenant, he spoke of the milestone of life and the expansion of God's kingdom and emphasized that in order to achieve this, we must receive the filling of the Holy Spirit. On the day of Pentecost, the filling of the Holy Spirit will come upon you. You must wait for that. And then he ascended. And that's why we must live a life that is con concluded only in Christ. And a life that's focused only on expanding the kingdom of God. And a life that realizes the mission given by Jesus only through the filling of the Holy Spirit. We don't need anything else. Everything else is just what's remaining from Satan. It's just what Satan uses to deceive you. We only need Christ, the filling of the Holy Spirit, and the kingdom of God. We must be organized within the um, Acts 1, 1 through 8. Then God will give you everything. If you cannot do that and you have multiple different hearts um, within yourself, that's why things don't work out. A mustard seed uh, um, parable in today's message gives us the answer to question how we can expand the kingdom of God and how we can experience answers of enlarging our tent. So I bless all Yewon believers in the name of the Lord that this year all believers may experience answers that enlarge the tent of your spiritual and physical life through covenantal challenges in the mustard seed vision. The first point, a disciple filled with the gospel's power of life. Verse 30 to 32 reads, And he said, With what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. Jesus explained the kingdom of God through this parable. This mustard seed parable made by Jesus is a parable that we are familiar with. Back in the day, mustard seed was widely used by Jewish people when describing something very, very small. And I've seen one before, and the size is comparable to the seeds of a to perilla seeds. Mustard seeds are a little bit smaller than them. And mustard seeds, they're so small that it's very difficult to even separate them one by one. After I ra raised up the church, about three years after, we had around 200 believers. And I said we should coat these mustard seeds and give it out to them to show how small they are. Because the people that come to church, they have a faith. And I wanted to show them that even if your faith is as small as this mustard seed, it will grow to become great. But they called me and said, Pastor, the seed is so small, we cannot coat one seed at a time. Can we coat two or three? And I said, okay, that's fine too. So it's that tiny to that extent. Mm -hmm. 
But actually, if you think about it, a grain of sand it might be smaller than a mustard seed. So then why did Jesus use a mustard seed parable? If we were looking for something that's really tiny, we can just use a grain of sand. Why did Jesus choose the mustard seed? That's because a mustard seed has life. A grain of sand does not have life. The smallest seed that actually has life is the mustard seed. So the important characteristic is that no matter how small it is, it still contains life. And these days it's so cold and the ground freezes as well. But look in the spring, what happens? These plants grow. Within this cold weather and within the frozen ground, it grows because it has life. And apparently when a plant grows out like that, it receives about 50 different scars as it grows. So just like how the mustard seed has life, the gospel also has life. That's what is being emphasized. And personally, I really like the term life, especially how it is depicted in 1 John chapter 5, verses 13, 11 to 13. And it reads, And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. And so you who are the children of God, you have eternal life. Because we have a living soul, there's no such thing as death. Only mankind have both a physical body and a spiritual soul. That's why we, can, we need eternal life. And so when it says here, whoever has the Son, in other words, whoever believes the true gospel, that Jesus is the Christ, and the solution to all problems is given this eternal life. And this life that changes our past, present, and future, it lasts eternally. It will not change. And the kingdom of God begins from receiving this blessing. And if you as an individual truly have life, then through you, your field will come alive as well, your workplace. It will change because you have life. You will be able to change your field. In the Greek-Persian War between Alexander the Great and King Darius the Third, and in, back in the day, these war, wars, they were actually um, looking at each other as they came up with their strategies before they went to battle. And King Darius once sent a bag full of sesame to King Alexander. What does this mean? It was Darius' message to Alexander saying, this is the amount of um, like army that we have. So let's not waste our time and just surrender. And King Alexander responded by sending an envelope with only one seed inside of it. And that was the mustard seed. And what does this imply? 
do not look down on us with numbers. We are armed with an unimaginable power of life, and we are ready to defeat you. That's what that implied when he sent the single mustard seed. In the end, King Alexander won the war, and the Persian Empire disappeared. And even spiritually, a crowd is not what is important. It is important for us to gather and give worship, but what's more important is the disciple. The disciple, the one disciple that has the gospel's power of life is most important. And I look forward to all Yewan Church believers standing as field evangelism disciples of 1,000 per person. The least one shall become a clan, and the smallest one a mighty nation. I am the Lord, in its time I will hasten it. The least one. That's what God does. Using the mustard seed, using the least one, using those who look small and weak, those who are lacking. Why? Because God is almighty. He does not need those who are well off or have a good background. God chooses to use those people. And we may be weak and in the worldly standard, we may not have anything to show off, but God looks at our faith and uses us. So all Yewan Church believers are disciples filled with the gospel's power of life. No matter where you are, you are like the mustard seed. And I bless in the name of the Lord that no matter where you are scattered, you will have the power of life just like the mustard seed and stand confidently as the absolute disciples that expand the kingdom of God. The second point, a disciple that expands the gospel of life. Verse 32 reads, When it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. So the scripture today is largely presenting two visions to us. And one is the vision that you as an individual must grab hold of, and the other is the vision that the Yewan community must grab hold of. If we look at the scripture, it tells us that after this mustard seed is planted, it grows to the extent that it puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. When I went to Israel, the mustard seed trees were very large. They were around three meters tall. And there was a whole street filled with those trees. And I was in the car and along the road were all these mustard seed trees. And so spiritually, you must go beyond yourselves. And that's the work of the Holy Spirit. You cannot do it on your own. You cannot do things on your own. But you must go beyond yourselves and embrace other people and proclaim the gospel to them. And you must reach a level where you can raise them up and truly train them. It will happen as long as you open your heart to that. And so you must have disciples. When you come to church, you must have a spiritual disciple that follows you. Not just someone who runs your errands, but a disciple, a spiritual disciple. Someone who truly feels overjoyed when they look at you and will chase you around as a disciple. That's why when you go to church, people, or no matter where you go, people must gather to you. You must never feel like you are lonely. Or you must never even have a chance to feel loneliness because you have disciples. If you receive grace and then you proclaim that grace, then people will try to listen to you. And even the church ministers, you can see those who have disciples and they come and drive them around and open their doors and close their doors for them. And so to that extent, it's showing that they are truly enjoying the word within their life. 
And so if you use humanism within your life, people will avoid you because they can sense that. So really look at this with a spiritual perspective. And so it became large to the point that the birds made nests in its shade. So you must be able to embrace other people before God and with the word. And that's why forum is important as well. And so if we apply the annual message, it means experiencing the answer of enlarging the place of your tent. When people gather, it's a joyful time. And when people truly gather around you, it's a very joyful time. And that's what I experienced from even when I was a deacon, even when I was a young adult. No matter where I go, and even now as a pastor, people gather around me. And you can have that experience even as a young adult or even as an elder. And these were people that were uh, the partners of doctors or uh, lawyers. They were like elites. And so there was this apartment building where these elites lived and it was close to the church in Busan at the time where I was. And so it was very easy for them to come there. And so I was an elder and they said, Elder, we have gathered a few people and would you please come and talk to us? And I said, what do you want me to say? And they said, just anything. And it, it was such a big house. I'd never seen a house that big. And then I just sat there and I didn't really have a topic, but they just wanted me to speak. And they all sat on the floor as they listened to me. And so that I was very joyful at the time because I received grace first. I experienced the filling, the word being fulfilled in my life. And so people had gathered to listen to that. Just like how the birds gathered to make nests in its shade. And what we must specially not lose hold of is to not be deceived by your current state or environment and circumstances. And you must be able to conf not be conceited and confess that I'm not the one doing anything. I cannot do anything because I'm weak and lacking. And through me, Jesus Christ works and Jesus Christ lives. So you're boasting about Jesus Christ who works through you, not your own boasting. That's what people want to hear as well. Those elites of the world, they don't want to hear things of the world. Instead, I should be listening if it's things of the world. But they want to hear about the works of the Holy Spirit. Even through you, there's nothing that you should be boasting about. But they want to hear the work that God did through you. That's why spiritually you must have experiences. So according to the form of the worldly people at the time, how would they have viewed the form of Jesus? He was someone from Nazareth and he was a carpenter. He wasn't a professor. He wasn't a doctor or a lawyer. I'm sure those things existed at the time, but he was just a carpenter. On top of that, he was the subject of focused attacks by the Pharisees and scribes who were the Jewish leaders. So physically, he was nothing. And it even says that physically, his appearance-wise, there was nothing um, in the Bible. It says that there was that he did not have some kind of beautiful appearance like many paintings these days. Those are just the imaginations of the artists. And so in a way, he was within a situation similar to walking on thin ice. As well as this, let's look at the form of the disciples that went around with Jesus. A 
according to the worldly standards and worldly perspective, they had nothing to boast about. There was nothing to show off about them no matter how hard they looked. However, astoundingly, the disciples who received the heavenly gospel just like the mustard seed that Jesus proclaimed were able to taste the spiritual growth that nobody could even imagine. And after the Holy Spirit came upon them in Mark's upper room on Pentecost, the disciples were able to boldly declare the truth of the true gospel that Jesus is the Christ with absolutely no hesitation, even before the undisputed power of the Jewish authority. So just like this, those who have the gospel of life as their imprint, root, and nature will be realistically used for the expansion of the kingdom of God, regardless of your worldly background and environment. If we look at verse 21 that precedes our scripture today, Jesus emphasizes that a lamp is not brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed, but rather to be put on a stand. Of course, if you're going to turn the light on and on lamp, you put it somewhere where it can be seen. So in other words, the gospel of Jesus Christ is not something that we hide or should be embarrassed about, but it's something that we must reveal. And at the time, Jesus was someone who had nothing going for him. He was just a Nazareth carpenter. And so people who followed him might have been considered people who were very stupid. Even when I was young, I found it embarrassing to sing um, hymns. And so I used to hide the, the hymn book. Back then, we didn't have these screens, and so we had to open the hymn books and Bibles to sing the praises. But even when I was young, it was embarrassing to believe in Jesus. It was to that extent. And I'm sure some of you who come from non-believing families, you receive a lot of persecutions from family members for believing in Jesus. And yet, he's telling us, do you believe in Jesus Christ? Then brightly reveal Jesus Christ and proclaim it. Don't put the lamp under a bed or a desk, but put it up on a stand and proclaim it. That's the evangelism camp. As a camp is about shining the light of Christ. So continuously proclaiming Jesus Christ in your region is the 4,000 partisan movement. And relaying this gospel of uniqueness to the fields all over the world is the 237 healing movement. And so, the pre-camp team went to Pakistan and they were looking at whether there was a place where 50,000 people could gather. And so with the resentment of people who have never heard the gospel before, we need to go into Pakistan and really deliver this gospel that Jesus is the Christ at least once. They must hear it. And we're not going there to boast about anything or show off in the worldly standards, but there's a resentment. And they have no choice but to be oblivious to it. Of course, there may be a little group of people who have heard it, but if we ask 50,000 people to gather, that will be a first time, and the Holy Spirit will really work upon that space so that even if it's just one person or one individual, we must create this space or opportunity for them to come to the um, listen to the absolute truth. And that's why the pre-camp team went first. And of course, they will give me a report, but I've heard that it wasn't as dangerous as we've been told. And 
And within that Muslim nation, we must do the 237 healing movement. Just like how it was proclaimed through the annual message, the Yewon community is advancing towards the 237 partisans. We must enlarge the place of our tent. If we go forward with faith, God will open the doors. The only problem is that we do not go forward. And that's embodying the mustard seed parable. And so the mission is to fulfill the three courtyards purpose and enabling um, as many nations and ethnicities and multi-ethnic people and 5,000 people groups to come into that courtyard. And I heard that a member of um, the group G.O.D. is here doing a fan signing event and so they were preparing for that. And so it's really a courtyard for Gentiles. And so really put up a lot of Bible verses around the place so people who walk in and out of this church can see that. It's a courtyard for Gentiles. And it's a courtyard for the next generation, our remnants, to revive and establish um, as the healing summits for the 237 nations. And the courtyard for prayer where no matter who comes into this place, they will be spiritually revived and spiritually healed. And as long as we have the faith of the mustard seed vision, then the transformative works will happen. And so the covenant of last year was may all the nations be possessed. It's not just the covenant of 2023. It's something we must hold on to for our entire life because the word of God is eternal as well. And that's why we have organized all the annual messages that we have had so far. Just pray holding on to that and it will be fulfilled. Until the second coming of Jesus, we need to hold on to the covenant and pray. And this year, 2024, our focus on is on enlarging the place of our tent so that we can really be capable of sustaining the three courtyards. The 237 economy, the light economy, and the remnant economy, and saving the future. Pray that all of that is restored. A poet once expressed that the farmer holding a seed in hand should be able to hear the sound of the birds. And this means that they must be sowing the seeds with hope and vision that these seeds will sprout and will attract birds as they grow. And so you must also have the hope and vision as you engage in the three team of three movement in the field, even if immediate visible results may not be evident. So when Yewan Church started in Mokdong, we began from our home under a dressing table. So we started because we saw the vision of the 237 nations and missions. But how did we begin? We began very humbly because we transformed the dressing table and put a white cloth on it and turned that into the pulpit. And then we moved into a building that was five stories tall, but there was no elevator. And so we had to go up a lot of stairs. And the family that came to the, that apartment and when we first started was the family of Elder Young and Elder uh, Chi. And 
And so although the start was humble, how has it transformed now? We're able to embrace the 237 nations and the 5,000 people groups. And we're able to really attract a lot more remnants into this church. So we started as a small mustard seed in my, in my apartment under a dressing table. But we had the vision and hope of the 237 nations and missions. And so we were able to expand into doing that work. And so in 2024, I bless all Yewan Church members to experience a year of personal and unity expanding of the mustard seed vision. So this is the conclusion. So Pastor George Whitfield, a pioneer of the diagonal movement, was asked a question. And the question was, what kind of testimony do you want to leave behind when you're leaving the world? And the pastor responded with conviction. Absolutely, I won't testify at the time of my death. Because I will leave no testimony at the time of my death, for I will witness Christ every day while I'm alive and continuously proclaim this Christ that I've experienced. So please refrain from using the word later was the answer that he gave. So believers, right now is important. If you sow the seed of the gospel now, you will undoubtedly bear fruit. And there's a famous saying, no one knows what they can achieve until they try. How can you know if you do not try? And it's a correct saying. Do not underestimate yourselves. Really, treat yourselves preciously. Don't underestimate yourselves. Think, I'm the one that will do world evangelization. If you underestimate yourselves, Satan will take hold of you and you will feel inferior and you won't be able to do anything. If God does it, then anything is possible. If you experience the power of the throne, if you experience the power that transcends time and space, God will truly use you and God will truly make you grow. This week, I happened to come upon the testimony of Pastor Kim In-jung, the testimony that he gave around 15 years ago. And he, he was within a pain that was unimaginable, and he confessed that Jesus was alive. And so I came upon these testimonies by chance. And the person at the time was um, going into fasting prayer in order to um, save their family. And so the mom who became worried because her child was fasting, they, she just came to church for him. And so it's astounding, these testimonies they, they give while they're very touched and they're crying. And that's why they're being used. So really, believers, hold on to the mustard seed vision and challenge yourselves. You may be weak and lacking, but really, through the power of the Holy Spirit that God gives you, you must be able to experience the scale of God. So I bless in the name of the Lord, you're able to expand your tents through this. Let us pray. Father God, all, let all our Yohan Church believers have the mustard seed vision and let them believe that when you work upon them, we'll be able to grow to the point that the birds come and make nests in its shade. Let us be able to really uphold your last mission of the 237 Nation evangelization. I pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.